call the Finance Committee of the Quincy City Council to order. Um, I, I'm going to read some open meeting language that needs to be read at the beginning of every meeting. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or a video recording of this, of this public meeting or transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledgeable, acknowledged and permissible. Okay, um, we got one item on the agenda tonight. Oh, uh, could the uh, could the clerk of committees call the roll? Councilor Andronico, Councilor Kane, present. Councilor Debona, present. Councilor Harris. Present. Council Liang. Present. Council Mahoney. Present. Council McCarthy. Present. Chairman Phelan. Present. Seven members have a quorum. Seven members, we have a quorum, so we'll begin. Um, what I'm going to do is basically, we've all received the packets of material. We come, all we've received all of our packets of material. There's several questions that were brought in by city councilors at the last meeting, and that, that information and all that was, was uh, provided to us. So at this point, um, I'm going to open it up to the council. Uh, Councilor Harris has his hands up first. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Phelan. Um, I'm satisfied with, with the answers and that were brought forth. So I'm right off the get-go tonight going to say motion to approve. There is a motion to approve. Um, but it's committee. We don't need a second, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go around first to the councilors to see if anyone and Council Yang. Second it as well, but um, okay. I wanted to also follow up with a couple of questions. And so I don't know, is Eric? Hi, Eric. I think most of these questions will be geared towards you. Um, I want to first to say thank you for you know putting all the information together. I think the bulk of the questions that I had were related um, to the finances, specifically with. Um, a breakout of the expenditures to date with the first two appropriations that came through at right, the 32 million and the 120 million and so i i did receive that um, it was helpful to go through i will say though and just for future reference if i could um even with this right I, and again i was happy to second the motion and that's my mindset here today but i do still want transparency um in in the process and so you know for the breakout when you're looking at expenditures and there's a line there's a category here that says description on it. The, sorry, I'm just going through the papers. The description for all of them, like all of the expenditures, the page and a half that I have here, all say capital expenditures. That's very nondescript, right? What I was looking for is more specifically, for example, um, you know, I'm probably gonna butcher this name here, but Castle Bros and Associates, I listed here a couple of times, Wooded and Curran, Greenberg, um, you know, there's a fencing company on here, right? Like one can assume that's for fencing, right? But you know what I'm saying? Like it's just, when Absolutely. I asked for a description, I meant more specifically than just capital expenditures. Well, yeah, and, and absolutely just to, to uh, colorize that just a little bit, Councillor, the reason it's labeled, that 5-8 it starts with, capital series funds. Could you speak up, I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry? Could you speak up? Oh, absolutely. So the reason it is called capital expenditures is actually a function of Massachusetts standard of accounting and not necessarily our system. So any org code, uh, sorry, any org code that ends in 5-8 or any object code more particular to this because it's a capital fund that begins with, uh, has an object code that begins with 5-8. They do that so when our auditors pull the system, they run everything under 5-8 and then they do an asterisk and that actually pulls all capital expenditures. And the account is in sub-based underneath that through the itemization you see. But with that account, so absolutely in the future, we can itemize it better as a presentational document. Uh, but a lot of times we're constrained just on how the logic of our accounting system has to flow. No, and that makes sense, right? Because it also makes it easy, I think, to categorize, you okay, know, absolutely. when it comes to reporting at the end of the day, you can just pull it all at once. But, you know, for the purposes of me when having to talk to folks and explain why we're spending as much as we are, it's, it's a lot more helpful to have this information in front of me with details. And even in the comment section, that refers to specific contracts or amendments to contracts, again, that's not helpful for somebody like me to be able to explain to folks, well, this is how much we spent on X, Y, and Z because it, it's not here in front of me. And so, again, even you know, with my support of this project, I still need to answer to folks, right? There's accountability here that I'm responsible for, and part of that is having the information that I need for it. So just with this, if you could provide that information um, in the coming so weeks, and then just moving forward as well, um, 
I understand and respect it's a little bit more work on your end, but again, it's just helpful for me to be able to account for where the money is going. Um, the other question I had too then is, if you could just walk me through, and we talked about this before in the past, um, I think when we you know, had questions about where in the process you can request funding and where, like, when that comes in front of us. Like you have a project in mind and you put together estimates on how much you think that will cost and when it comes time to then bond out that money, you need to come to us to ask for a range for what that could be. Now, you know, the 23 million that's in front of us today, let's just say for any other project, right? My understanding of it is, you know, we approve up to the 23 million, but in the past when we've had these conversations, you've said it doesn't necessarily mean that you're bonding the full 23 million, right? And so in this specific instance, you are coming to us with the 23 million saying that is the guaranteed maximum price. This isn't a, you know, this is the top of it and we might not bond to that much. It's saying, you know, my understanding is, Nina, we do need the full 23 million because now we have the guaranteed maximum price. So at which point of the, the sort of scope of the whole project when you put this together, do you get to a guaranteed maximum price? Because I feel like if it's possible for this instance, why wasn't it possible for the 120 million when it was first brought to us? I, I think the construction of a guaranteed max price contract would probably be a better discussion for uh, Mr. Shea or Mr. Walker. In terms of the financial instrument, the bonding that occurs, that occurs as, the, um, as we project future expenses, then we'll draw down that 23 million in, in blocks. Um, the, the order that exists in front of the body tonight is an appropriation. So appropriation allows our office to know what's the maximum we can borrow for it. And then if we, we follow that along as we need it, um, we would never, we'd never take all 23 million at exactly once, even though we often model that so you, we can see the worst case scenario. We just wouldn't pay extra interest costs to borrow that money before it's needed. Uh, but on the GMP question, Mr. Shea, with it. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> that is a great question, Counselor, because that's a, uh, a matter that we are always working towards as we move through a conceptual design into design development, into de detailed design documents. These massive projects are always evolving. Uh, I'm gonna start because I work on the, the conceptual and design development phase, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, Suffolk Construction also to talk about guaranteed maximum price contracts. But the original $120 million appropriation uh, was prepared based upon cost estimates from estimating companies for the purposes of having confidence of bringing a construction manager on board. Um, many of you will remember when we were here in the spring of 2020, uh, we had had seven statements of qualifications received from contractors and we were reviewing them. Uh, during that time, Suffolk Construction was eventually the contractor who was selected. While that was going on, the design was also going from design development to final design. And you need a certain, uh, I'm going to say, a, a well-matured design, maybe not a final or perfect design because there's no such thing, but a well-matured design to lock into a guaranteed maximum price contract. However, during that process, we, we chose to request funding up front to continue to manage expectations on what the magnitude of this project. At that time, uh, we thought that the building was going to be a $90 million building. It was 88 and change. Uh, with the hyper escalation we faced, that certainly hasn't been the case. It's frustrating and disappointing, uh, but it's what we're here to face. Uh, but in terms of when a guaranteed maximum price contract, when's the optimal time to actually lock it in and sign it's after a number of subcontracts have been released when hard bids are in hand. That's what we have now. And I'd actually like Chris to um, come up and just speak about his process of getting hard bids because then we have confidence that most of the unforeseen conditions uh, have been resolved. Most of the design details have all been resolved. Many of the, the issues that arise at a conceptual or a design development stage have been thoroughly worked through. Um, and then contractors can go out and confidently accept bids, uh, whether it's through filed sub bids through trade contractors, uh, or whether it's through negotiated bids for contractors who are not filed sub bids. Um, Chris, would you add anything to that? Thanks, Joe. Good evening. Um, 
So the file sub-bid process, or the bidding process, is based on having a completed set of documents and specifications to the greatest extent possible. Uh, those bidders will go out to uh, the early file sub-bidders were the first group that went out, which was a hard bid, which was your typical rip and tear, and which you've all seen the data on that from the, from the last meeting, um, uh, which we work with the city uh, purchasing group, as well as the design team. And, uh, producing those documents that are biddable. And then the balance of contracts are done through the non-file sub-bid trades, which we get three bidders, and go through really deep dives on scope reviews with the design team and the subcontractor base, uh, interviews and identifying where their numbers and what their numbers represent and what's included in the scope. Um, once they get to their final numbers, then the awards are initiated um, based on the lowest best value. And that's the, the guaranteed maximum price that you have in front of you today which is really driven by the, from the market data that comes back from subs. Okay, um, I appreciate that you're responding with your professional background. So I'm just gonna repeat it back to make sure I understand this correctly. So the process is if there's a project, <clears throat> if there's a project that wants to get done, it goes to conceptual design first, right? Conceptually builds it out, think about what it is that you want. And then it goes into design development, which is the more specifics of, I guess, materials and everything else that you can think of around labor costs, right, et cetera. Um, and then that'll bring you to an estimated number, right? That's the first time you see an estimated number in front of you is during the design development phase. Is that correct? Um, there are, during the conceptual phase, we do produce numbers, but they are typically cost curve or rules of thumb number, like $800 per square foot to mm -hmm. build something. Um, so they're, they're conceptual numbers by nature. And you are correct, then you move into a design development phase. Uh, then you moved into a detailed design phase. Uh, that's when we start to produce the, the hundreds or thousands of details that need to be priced by all the various trades. So wait, is, it, is that the point where, sorry to interrupt, but is that the point where you then get the number that you think, okay, this is, I think, the number we should go out to bid with? Right, is during that third phase? These are the, this is where we get to the documents we can go out to bid with and we can get solicit prices from filed subtrades or vendors that we would then lock in. Okay, but it's. And, and move towards a, a guaranteed maximum price contract, a hard number. But, but so the, 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 the concept here is that you can, when you have the numbers from the detailed design phase, you can't <clears throat> go out and talk to contractors and get numbers. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and bid for numbers until you come to us to get the appropriation approved, correct? Uh, generally, you get what I'm, like, I'm just trying to like understand very that's a, that's a fair question. That. Generally speaking, we would like to ensure the appropriation is, is been approved by the council and is in hand uh, when soliciting bids. Uh, there are strategies at times to go out and get bids from various contractors for projects uh, and then come to this body with a, with a hard bid number in hand. Uh, but that many, hard bid number is still not the guaranteed maximum price yet, is it? Uh, at, at this point, we're we have hard bids in hand and Suffolk is, is ready to commit to a guaranteed maximum price contract. For this, for this appropriation, I, what I'm getting at with all these questions is because the reason why I want to understand this um, is because I guess I don't understand why that we didn't have a guaranteed maximum price when the 120 million came in front of us. Do you know what I'm, do you know what I'm getting at? Like, I, I just... Look, let me just be clear, right? The, the, the concept of this project is not something I'm opposed to. The, the questions and the concerns I have this evening are how we got here with the numbers that are in front of us and, and trying to now sort of backtrack and understand why it is that this couldn't have been done with that first request and we would already be on our way to construction, right? Like it's, yes, you had to come in front of us with a second request and it's guaranteed maximum price, that's great, but couldn't that have been accomplished months ago? You know, we wouldn't be here today and again, the project would already be underway. Um, but we did follow a different path. Uh, actually, I'll let Mr. Walker speak to this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> yes, Council, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, there is a process which we've done on other projects where we do get everything done, bid, contract ready to sign before we come to the body for the full appropriation. In this particular case, considering the size and scope of the project, we were still talking about an ancillary appropriation from this body a major appropriation from this body to get to the GMP place where we were getting those hard bids. So even if 
take you two scenarios. The one we're in today where we used a, a valid construction estimate at the time um, where we were working with all the parties involved, doing the architects, the construction managers, but it was still just an estimate at that time. We didn't have a GMP. If we had not done that, so that was the scenario we, we ended up doing, and the actual pricing came back higher uh, based upon inflation and those other factors that we discussed at the last meeting. The other alternative would have been for us to come in with, I would say, uh, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, 15 to 20 million um, from the point of after the first, after the land acquisition, another 15 or so million probably, um, that's an estimate, um, to get us to the point where we then could have developed, we would have had all of the horses in the stable, everyone working, doing the bidding, doing all the work, Suffolk on board, get to the point where you get to the GMP and then come back for the appropriation. Um, because of the size of this project, and we, since we were gonna ask for X amount million anyways, we used the construction estimate we had at that time. Now, generally speaking, that has been an effective process mm -hmm. for us before, I don't know um, it, there may have been more than two projects, and we've done a lot of projects uh, over the course of the last 10, 15 years, where we've come back for an additional appropriation based upon what actually ends up in the construction contract. But this is the, the most substantial one. This is probably one of the only ones that we've had to do that on. Um, and that was a product of a lot of different things. But yes, absolutely, um, we could have. And in this environment, I know there are other projects that we're looking at now uh, that are in the pipeline that we're absolutely gonna come to this body first for those soft cost design appropriation. It will be smaller, it won't be the whole package, but it's gonna to get to us a place where we can come back and uh, do the whole package with a bid, with a, not every project has a GMP, it, it depends on the scope of the project, but when you actually have that final number. Um, but that is something we are very cognizant of. It's, it's, one way, it's two ways to do the same thing, um, and we would be back here for uh, another appropriation regardless. It's just a question of which appropriation came when. There mm -hmm. would have been a smaller one back then, and this would have been a bigger one. Yeah, <clears throat> no, I appreciate that. And I, I think um, you answered it with, you know, the sort of understanding of where I'm coming from with this, right? Look, I, again, I, I I think that financially, luckily we're, you know, the city is in a position where we can do these kinds of projects and, and improvements to the public buildings across the city that are very much needed, right? The infrastructure work, the public buildings, all of it. and. That's great that we're in this position. I, I want to be clear, I'm not happy about this process and, and how we got here today. Um, it sounds like you know, we can do it differently moving forward. Again, I do understand in the past it has worked and that's great, but when it doesn't work, right, it, it's, I think, valuable to look back and say, okay, how could we have done this differently? Because I, again, when it comes to how we got here, I'm not happy with the process. I, I think that it, there's a level of trust and accountability that needs to happen and I don't feel as though that happened with this. Um, I'm happy to see that you know, it's for the right project. I'm just not happy again with the process. And so I appreciate you sort of walking me through it, Eric and, and Joe and Chris explaining this to me so thoroughly. Um, yeah, I just, I think moving forward, it's, the process is gonna have to be different, whether it's a project this size or even something smaller, because it is, again, my responsibility up here to account for the spending in the city. And I can't do that when, you know, the process ends up being the way it is and my hands are tied. So again, thank you for answering my questions and, and educating me on the process. I do appreciate it. Um, that's all I have for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, any other councils? Council De Bono. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've already had a, a lot of deliberations. Just have a couple comments. I want to thank um, for the breakdown of the 32 million um, monies that have been spent thus far, and a breakdown of all the different uh, vendors and comments on on everything. Thank you very much for this. Appreciate it. Um, did a little field trip on Thursday down to Broad Street. Um, got a chance to um, walk the grounds with uh, Father Bill's director, John Yaswinski, and Patrick Ronan, um, just to see the existing building and the new building that's being built um, across the street from that, the $24 million new Father Bill's, um, which has got a great new model coming in. Um, and I wanted to see the progress of that. Um, I was able to see the new retaining wall that abuts that to Field Street. Hopefully it diverts a lot of traffic and vehicles um, into Broad Street, which is, as, as you know, I've talked about this in the past, is a very dangerous intersection. Um, public safety headquarters, I'm about public safety measures. And um, during the last meeting, there's a f fatality that happened right there, I think, I believe it, on Veterans Day night. and. Um, 
it's, it's, it's a concern of mine. I go by that two to four times a day. I have to drive by there every day, every morning on the commute, every evening. Um, I know we've talked about it in the past, um, about getting proper, um, I guess, crosswalks um, at the intersections there at the Th uh, Thomas McGrath Highway intersection down to um, obviously the C Street slash uh, Coddington intersection, which is Fax and Field right there. We've, we've got to do a better job with that particular area. Um, we've got to divert a lot of the traffic in and out, maybe down that Field Street. Um, do you have any, uh, I know, um, Joe Shea, you, you've talked about a little bit more. Can you, can you just elaborate real quick a little bit further on what the mitigation is going to be um, as we build this new public safety headquarters? Happily, Councillor. Thank you. Yeah, this, this project, as we've talked about it, uh, quite often the focal point is the 120,000 square foot public safety complex. Uh, but there are a number of associated, I'm going to call them circles, around that complex to make sure that the system as a whole, the building as a whole, the neighborhood as a whole works. <coughs> uh, the rebuilding of Broad Street uh, was an important element from an infrastructure standpoint. The addition of the Field Street extension was a key element to allow vehicles to exit to the south without having to pull out across the street from McDonald's in the car wash and try to take a left, uh, which we've all observed, certainly very dangerous. Uh, and that challenge is also um, exponentially more dangerous when pedestrians are just crossing midstream five lanes of traffic, uh, potentially to leave Broad Street and go to, over towards McDonald's. So as Concentric circles around the public safety complex from a transportation standpoint. There's been repeated discussions with TPAL, discussions with the state, discussions with the project team about how to make the intersection at Coddington, Southern Artery, and C Street safer, and how to make the intersection, I'm going to say at Roxy's, safer. And by doing so, making some transportation additions such as a barrier and a fence down the middle of Southern Artery, uh, very similar to what we have over here on Granite Street near Stop and Shop, such that we, we move pedestrians who wish to go potentially from the Housing Resource Center toward the downtown to an intersection to cross at an intersection, push the button, and not walk across five lanes of traffic, and also prevent vehicles from having to cross either coming out of Broad Street, three lanes of traffic, or cars might be zipping around the corner to get to House Neck, or as we've all seen, people coming out of McDonald's, but choosing to go north, cross two lanes of traffic, and uh, basically dive in to that roadway network. Uh, so the Field Street connector provides an important node to allow everybody to get south, whether it's people after work leaving, um, whether it's Mm -hmm. Our first responders, although many of our first responses come from the vehicles already out within the city, all the cruisers that are already out. And uh, we would work closely with Father Bills also on a pedestrian pathway, making sure that if their staff wishes to leave from Field Street, because the new housing resource center basically has uh, a parking and access on Broad Street, but they can get to Field Street and come down the hill next to uh, TD Bank and out. What's very important right there, um, as you exit Field Street and you got the Quirk Ford on one side, the Quirk Nissan on the other, is there's a light there and, and it stops traffic. So if we can get almost everybody to go in that personal direction, especially people that are in walking pedestrian traffic, it'll be a lot better. Obviously, we get into weather conditions with rain and snow and all these other things that are factors that make the visibility obviously getting darker earlier. I think this fatality ass, uh, action happened when it was a very big rainstorm out there the other night, and it happened right around, I think, 6 o'clock, 7. Uh, it, it was a little darker. It's got darker early. And it's, it's been a concern of mine as I go through there and sometimes see people just walking out to McDonald's from Broad Street, just walking right out, and no, no fear, just walk right out, and we'll see what happens. Um, but I'm glad we got some safety precautionary measures that are going to be put in place. 
Um, we, we've, we've deliberated about this quite a bit here. We knew an appropriation of funding was going to come in front of this body. Um, you know, I, I, I looked over as we were taking, walking the grounds of Father Bill's, the existing building. They said in the spring of 2023 that the building will be finished and then they can tear down, obviously, um, the existing building that, that folks are in right now. I also looked over and saw that the animal shelter is, is got an excavator in there, so they, they, they pretty much have that down as well. Um, so I do see some progress. Obviously, we paved, you guys paved uh, Broad Street in the last few months, maybe two months, where it was a dirt road to begin with. So I do see progress going on. I don't want to see a situation where construction costs even get more escalated here. I don't want to keep the ball rolling. So with that, uh, I appreciate everybody coming in tonight. Um, this is an important project for the city um, to move it forward, um, and I'm in full support of it tonight. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, on the motion, Council Mahoney. Hi, um, I, I'm, I think I'm going to Eric, Mr. Mason, if I could ask you a question. Um, Nina and I were both just discussing an attachment to. Oh, yes. Um, it's a great breakout. You kind of show the debt services um, going through you know, 2023 all the way to 2052. But what the graph doesn't really show, it, I, first, does the graph include the $23 million, the appropriation that we're talking about this evening? There's a second attachment that was provided the first week, uh, with the first session we had that does include that. So this doesn't include the direct $23 million, but it does include the previous appropriations. Okay, so it does not include the $23 million. No, so. I believe there's a separate chart that was, it was included with the original okay. uh, data pack. Okay. So the second part of that question is um, what we were hoping to, to learn, I think, with, um, what, we're, what we're asking for is the debt-to-budget ratio for our, bar our borrowing power. So I know we have um, a set of ordinance that we can borrow up to between six and a half and seven and a half. So where does that land six us? Six to seven and a half, Council, yes. Pardon me? Yep. Oh, six to seven and a half is what the policy says, and that was included with the first data pack. So I, I don't have that in front of me, so I have this in front of me tonight, so I appreciate okay. that. So, so where does that land us here? Um, where does it, this project land us? Yeah. Um, it lands us in a, depending on what the rates would be for this borrowing, mm -hmm. um, at a peak of about 7.27%, if I remember that chart exactly. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So it doesn't leave us with a lot of borrowing power. Um, 37, 33 basis points of borrowing on a $400 million budget is, is quite substantial. And that would only be in the immediate next year. And then there's a quite, this is the original package, yeah. quite a so, dramatic drop. I appreciate that. So just to, just for somebody at home, because this is when, you know, I, I realize bonds are different, but like when you're talking about, um, you know, purchasing power for a house or equity in your house, you know, it's usually an 80-20 rule, right? And when um, COVID hit, banks pulled back and basically said they went to 70-30. Like you, you had to, you had to, think you could only borrow 70% of what the house was valued at. So, so because organizations try to protect themselves from that debt to ratio um, because they don't want to have anything default. You know, we won't default here in the city of Quincy, hopefully. Because yeah, would we be will dead. always have taxpayers. Yes, we I have would. excess levy. I, you told me that before too. We have excess levy, which just means the taxpayers. It's a factual statement, correct? Yep, yes. Which just means the taxpayers, all at home, should realize that when we're getting to the seven and a quarter, um, seven point two seven, that we're getting up there on our, on our potential borrowing power, and we have to be careful about that because we have a lot of more projects that are coming in. We had a ton that came in this year, and we have even more that are projected from. Um, the administration. So that's a concern. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's that's that, so that was one question. So I appreciate all that information that was provided. Thank you, Mr. Mason. I, that was that was the only question. I do appreciate it. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Um, one of the other questions that I had, and it might be to the CM. I'm not sure, but in you know, in other projects where I was talking to people, they were basically. I'm just questioning. Do we? Um, so for the last 19 months, I know that we have the hard bid right now, but we were talking about, you know. Um, um, the the design details and then getting to uh, a more um, set design. But then we were doing work over there for the enabling projects too. Um, do we have a monthly report that goes in to describe the progress that includes the financials um, to really a schedule of progress? Like is there something that gets reported? And who does that get reported to when you're working on these projects? Like month to month, I'm assuming that you were seeing things escalate you, you, in, in the package that you provided to me. Um, some of it was talked about the, um, 
and of course I don't have it in front of me, um, it was talked about the, um, I think the underground work that you, the abatement work, the things that you wouldn't know until you actually broke open the ground. So is there, were those identified as, and what, what were some of those examples of the problems that we were seeing? Uh, on your first question, Council, there is a, there is a monthly uh, requisition review. I think that answer was maybe yep. to question number 17. And that formulates basically the monthly milestone check-in. Mm -hmm. um, we use it for the purposes of payment, the purposes for reviewing open issues. Uh, there are two weekly meetings that occur uh, with the whole team to review status of ongoing projects. So yes, there is there is a lot of things happening out there all the time. So yeah, I assume, I assume there was, but I don't think we've actually reviewed that that, that kind of detail. I just I'm not. I, I want people at home to know that this is something that's being reviewed, looked at, and I'm assuming um, who in the administration sits on that review. Uh, for is the it, for the what, weekly calls, Commissioner Hines and his, portions of his team are with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we have. Uh, Helen Murphy, the Director of Operations, joins us on the Monday call. Uh, and then, as necessary, different specialists within the city. Uh, Shelley has joined us, for example, on energy issues from, from time to time during planning. Mm -hmm. um, Is there anybody on the city council or anybody? There's nobody on the city council. Like, on the school side of things, there's a building committee and there's a school committee member that kind of sits on that just to listen to what's happening, to know like what the costs are to see. Not that they're actually providing, it's more like a silent thing to like understand what's happening with the project. There's nobody like on the council, it's just, it's just city administration and, and you guys, there right? There are no counselors. Uh, I, just, I just wanted, somebody asked me that question and I know there's not, but I thought I would ask that question. It seems like it would be a great idea. I know on the school side, the school committee does have somebody that sits there and it's able to report back because it's been 19 months you know, 19 months you've been working on this, mm -hmm. and you know, we came in for $120 million, which I have to tell you, like, I struggled to make that decision for 120, but I know that this is something we need. And I'm looking out at all of the police force that are here. I know that building needs to be done. And $120 million was a lot, and, and we said yes to it. And 19 months later, we're coming back before us, and I know, I know people are saying that we've had a lot of deliberations on this. We had one meeting. We had one meeting that you came in and told us $23 million, and this is the second meeting, so it's not a lot of deliberations. And as far as I know, there's nothing within the building itself other than the garage. There have been no, there have been no edits to the building. There's been nothing that we've done to the building that's gonna potentially bring the cost down. Is that correct? No changes to the design. No, there, during the course of the activity has been repeated changes to the design to seek efficiencies. The, the garage was an example. So uh, what what in the building what what in the building were substantial? That's so if that's the case, Mr. Shea. That wasn't shared with us. There's no details of like we changed the windows, we changed the roof line, we took. The, I didn't say any of that stuff. That did, did, many of the changes, Councillor, come from our construction partner. They're dealing with sequencing. Mm -hmm. Oh, sequencing. So for correct, the work. Of sequencing of work mm -hmm. for efficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the way we're doing earth and ground support was another example within the package. But another example that you gave us in the package, you also said, however, for unforeseeable nature and hazardous materials and abatement underground construction inherently is more risky than vertical construction as the work often reveals underlying conditions that were unknown to the actual work that was performed, correct? In the, that is correct. Okay, yes. so what, what, what were some of those examples that might have escalated the cost that were something that we didn't know about? Uh, well, we were digging in the ground for the fuel station. We ended up finding some asbestos in the ground, a regulated, regulated material. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe the same potentially on 39 Broad Street. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were buried materials that were unforeseeable that when we encountered, uh, we addressed appropriately from a regulatory standpoint, but they also came at a cost that was unanticipated. Okay, so I appreciate the work that was provided to us, and I appreciate the efforts that are happening. And I know that this was not an easy project for any of you to take on. Um, this is just, a, I'm just curious. Do, do all projects of this nature, like, like we've worked on large projects in the city of Quincy. We have three, we have Woodward and Kern, we have yourself, that you're representing Woodward and Kern for Granite Partners, and we have Steve, Mr. Chris, I don't know how to say it, I'm so sorry, Mr. Chris, I'm ruining your name, is it close? Is it close? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's close. that would be the Crucial Group. Crucial Group. But I, 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 so, um, I'm from Boston. <laughs> so, there's three project managers on this. Is that is that because there's three different sites here? There's, that's a lot of project managers. So that's that, that that's just that's something that somebody asked me to. Three. Um, we each have our own specialty. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of the, or have had done a lot of the 
preliminary concept work, the upfront mm -hmm. work, and the outreach work. And the architect, I forgot there was an architect too. So. The architect yeah. does the architecture. Yep. Woodland Curran does the coordination, remediation, and owner's project management work. Mm -hmm. uh, and Steve Crucial does a lot of the vertical construction clerk of the works type work. So, so we each have our own specialty as opposed to three entities performing the same role. That's, yeah. that's not the case. Yep. So I, I understand that. There's also three different separate bills that are coming in. So this is really a tale of two cities. This is what I like to say in this particular case. And this was a struggle for me to get to 120. The 23 million, I'm struggling to do this because the, the police station is a priority. It truly is. It's been a, it should have been a priority much before 2022. It should have been done much earlier than that. But we're here today. And we approved $120 million. And I understand what the administration is saying that, you know, we could have gone about it one way. We could have, there's no accountability other than to say, you know, we went through the list of things. It's the accountability part. But, you know, which is COVID and, you know, it's, it's we, but those are also predictable because in 2021, we knew that those prices were going up and people were preparing for that. And it's been in the news. It was no secret. It was no surprise. When we were saying yes to $120 million, we were also saying, as I said before, there was, a, there was a, a couple of times that it was said there might be money on the table. Like, there was no fear that $120 million wasn't going to be enough. I mean, in my head, I was thinking, wow, that's really amazing that you're saying that in this market. But I'm not going to say, hey, you probably should think about, think about curtailing that kind of conversation. That's all on a Quincy Council, City Council meeting. You can go back and watch it if you have nothing to do. Maybe you're not watching the Patriots on, on Thanksgiving. I encourage you, go ahead. Mr. Cruchel is going to do it, I can tell. <laughs> it's on YouTube. Um, but the thing that I'm trying to say here is that, you know, the, the police headquarters, and the other thing is, is this is, uh, this is 90 percent of this is the police headquarters. 10 percent is the emergency management and, and some smaller and some of the fire department. But we're calling it a public safety headquarters. But we don't have, that, that makes everybody, the taxpayers believe that this is going to be all one unit, the police, the fire, everybody's going to be there, and it's not. Because we purchase land and we still have to do the fire headquarters. Does anybody have any idea of how much that's going to cost? Seven and a quarter is where we're at for our debt ratio. Any idea when that's going to happen? Is that going to happen in 2025? Is it going to happen in 2052? Because that debt ratio is looking... Through you, Mr. Chairman, um, this is a public safety headquarters. Um, the entire administrative staff, um, leadership team of the fire department and all the civilian operations within the fire department will be located in this building. Um, fire headquarters, where it is right now, uh, that will become engine one uh, and ladder one. Um, and that process is undergoing design right now. Um, we're working with the fire chief uh, the members of Local 792 and uh, our administration on working through the design. Mm -hmm. uh, this project goes first, uh, and that is one of the projects we're talking about uh, in the very near future. Okay. So that's not, if you go back and watch the council meeting, that's not how it was presented. It was presented that the fire headquarters would be recreated because we don't have enough space because of, we can't put the vehicles, we can't have everything housed in one place. So we're going to have th that. That was what was described. So thank you very much, Mr. Walker. Um, so the reason why I say this is a tale of two cities. So this is so back um, at the beginning of this administration, in 2008, in a project that was costing the city a lot of money at that time, it was Quincy High School. It was 3.6 million dollars over budget. That's nothing compared to 23 million dollars. But I'm going to read something. My message to the school committee and the building committee is: I'm not going to entertain bringing new monies for this project. Therefore, the building committee has some tough decisions to make. Koch said. If they have trouble making those decisions, I certainly will do that task. That is a different administration that we have today. Because today, we have, and that, by the way, $72 million of that project was, was, um, was paid for by the state. And when they came back, they explained the bid alternatives included options such as deleting the walkway and using aluminum panels versus copper for cost reductions of over a million dollars. We have a copper roof, a slate roof. We ask those questions. They're millions of dollars, three and a half million. None of that was brought to us because this administration said, nothing will change in this building. This building's too important and I want all these, I, we want all the structures. And it's a utilitarian building, it's not. What we're taking down is the utilitarian, dangerous, unhealthy building that shouldn't be there. What we're putting up has bells and whistles and has materials that could change that would not make the building any less safe for the people who work in it but will cost the taxpayers of the city of Quincy more money. 
23 million more. Furthermore, this is the part that really got me. In addition to the rising cost, a set of leaky oil tanks at the north end of the site was discovered in 2006, which is expected to cost one and a half to $1.8 million. Koch called for full transparency for the entire project. We're getting spreadsheets that say capital improvement. 19 months, 19 months this project's been going on. We didn't hear a boo other than what we read in the Patriot Ledger saying that they were changing, and we can take our time. We can take our time. We have time on our hands. So we're not going to rush it. So instead of getting this done, like we said, in $120 million, this building would be done by 2023. It's now going to be 2025, and it's going to cost the taxpayers $23 million more. No shame in the game, because you know what? We're not going to change anything. And when I say that, I say it with due respect, because you can. You can go back and you can change the way the roof line is. You can change those oval windows at the top to square windows. And many people have to do that. If you watch any of the Home Channel shows, they'll show you. Isn't that fun, Mr. Cushel? You like that, right? They'll show you the unexpected things that they come upon, and they have to make the decision. Are we going to have the guest room? Are we going to have the bathroom? Just to make the perspective understandable for people at home. But more importantly, I don't just make these decisions on my own. I actually talk to a lot of people. I've seen police officers at the grocery store, at the Interfaith Social Service event the other day. Wherever I see people, I talk to them. They want the building. But they do question the cost, because some of them live here in the city of Quincy, and those tax dollars are going to end up going into their pockets to be able to pay for that. They're frustrated because they've waited a long time for that building. But the comparisons again. In 2008, it was the Great Recession. We were hit at that time with uncertainty in the economy. And it was hard. There was a lot of belts being pulled in, and it hurt. We lost teachers, we lost firefighters, we lost police. And now we're in 2022, and it's COVID. Different time, same problem. You can actually make it more cost effective and actually show that we are actually respecting the taxpayers as well. But to say that we're not going to change anything about that building says we don't respect the taxpayers. And now let's talk about those, the taxpayers. There are people at home that are struggling. They're on fixed incomes. You know, it's food challenges for them. $100 more a month, they don't get a raise. Heat and electricity are going up. Not by a little, by a lot, and they're going to have to pay for that. And it's not just seniors. It's also young families. It's people who are maxed out in their equity, 80-20. They can't take out that equity. Their credit cards, if they have credit card debt, they're going to be going up because, as we all know, the interest rates are going up. So everybody who's at home are going to feel this pinch. And finally, in two weeks, on December 5th, we'll be setting the tax rate on the budget that we set for 2023. But I want to remind everybody, because they always remind me, oh, well, you can cut the budget. But quite honestly, what you can cut is things in a building that we're talking about today that won't affect anybody, the safety of the people who are working in the building, but could help the taxpayers of the city of Quincy. Father Bills got COVID money to build Father Bills. COVID money came into this city. Transparency? Mm-mm. No transparency. It was like a kid in a candy shop buying real estate. The Monroe Building. It was before the city council. It looked like it was going to be a vote no. But what did this administration do? They went out and bought it with COVID money, when they could have been using that COVID money to offset the taxes in other ways for the taxpayers of the city of Quincy, that it could be used for. And it could have been used for the infrastructure that we were talking about in the city. It could have been. So to say that it couldn't be is just, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's really disappointing. It's incompetency, actually, because you're not using the money for the set portions of what it was supposed to be used for. And instead, we're here tonight for $23 million more. And it's a hard, fast $23 million because those bids are out. But as we know, if we change some of the things in the architectural design, it may have come in lower. And if you had done that, if you had done that, and you showed me, it came in at $23 million, but we changed a few things. We took the copper off, and it's, it, that's saving us three and a half million, five million, so it's only going to be $15 million more. I might have been able to get there. But to say you're not changing anything, because the building that's there is so bad, we want to make sure the building we put up is so memorable for 100 years. It's still going to be there for 100 years. But it's going to take the taxpayers. 2052? I don't know, Mr. Mason, that went up pretty far. Seven and a quarter? I know there's going to be things that come off, but we'll be paying a lot more money for this debt. 
So unfortunately, and I struggle with this because trust me, I would like nothing better than to get to a yes. But it wasn't shown to me in any capacity that we were actually working towards doing this for the taxpayers. Thank you very much. Okay, Councilor uh, McCarthy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> you know, I hear a lot of my colleagues and they mentioned how do we get to this point? Escalation or inflation didn't start in Quincy. We got a good group down in Washington that's doing a heck of a job to help us with inflation, and I'm being sarcastic. Um, this is rampant across the nation. Oil at $6, and, and I don't have to go through it. Um, everybody in this place knows. The additional money for the police station is what it is. No one here got into any, you know, we made a mistake and, and, and we should have done it a different way. It's what everybody is going through right now with small projects or big projects. Joe Q Public holding off. Maybe it'll get better. Maybe it'll get worse. Um, but we're not getting any help out of Washington at all. Um, it, it's going the other way. And... Um, you know, we're going to move forward. That police station, and I know it well, um, is, uh, is awful. It's terrible. That whole area is going to be improved. When we get to the Squantum, Middle, um, Squantum Elementary School, the new fire station, the Richard de Cristofaro Special Ed Center, we're going to continue to move forward, figure it out, maybe sharpen the pencils a little bit. I'm in full support of this police station. And I'm full support of anything to help the first responders of education uh, in Quincy. But when I hear comments as though the administration started, in, you know, the inflation, what happened here? Not here, it's everywhere. You can go across every state, everywhere. And it's not going to get fixed until someone above us does something to rein it back in. And we all know that, we see the market, we see what happens. Now in two years, it could be great again. It might be, might be uglier, but um, I'm not gonna sit around and um, hold up a project like that uh, to, to, um, to debate whether you know, it's gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. Uh, and any, any cuts that are made are just gonna make it not the state of the art police station, safety center that we want. So I'm in full support of this, Mr. Chairman. Um, it should have been done a while ago. We all, we all know that, but things happen. A lot of things. We'd like to get everything done tomorrow, but we're not. Uh, but I think the team's done a good job. Mr. Hines came back with some good, good answers, which I think everybody up here knew what they were going to do. They were going to escalate. So... The first responders always have my support, no matter what uh, happens out there in regards to day to day or facilities, and that goes for fire and police, and even the DPW workers, the city workers. Quincy's got a really good thing going. Um, we're just caught up in a thing that we didn't start, but we got to figure out how to finish. So, thank you. Thank you, Council McCarthy. Um, the chair will take a minute of privilege. I uh, haven't spoke yet, and I'd like to speak on this item. Currently with the police station, um, I have this public safety station, basically, is what we're doing. Um, I was here back in 1988 when the original police station came in, and I saw cost cutting. I saw a lot of things happen that left it in a building that I refused to vote for it the night it came into the city council because I saw too many problems from day one. It was totally unfunctional. A lot of veteran police officers who were there who know just, just as well as I do. It was a building that absolutely didn't service the, the, the first responders then, and it, you know, it's, it's a stretch. I've had to work in that building when I was the IT director to get things working, and it was usually a nightmare whenever we went somewhere in that building. So I think we have a chance now. If we decide not to pass this money tonight, we're not going to be doing a station, you know, a public safety. Are we going to wait another 10 years or something to do it? And uh, I think now 
is the time. We have the money. We have the thing. We should be moving forward on it, and I plan on supporting it. I always respect my counselors who come up with different ideas and want us to look at things. But I think at this point, we've looked at the numbers. Inflation is something that basically has hit everyone. And it's, it's, there's not much a chance. Are we going to leave, a, leave it half finished the way it is right now, or are we going to move forward? So um, I am voting in the affirmative for this tonight. And, um, and I, I will be voting yes on it. I think it's something that's long overdue. That's something we have. We, we, it's time to accomplish it. It's time to finish this job. So um, at this point on the motion, um, there, there's motion on the floor. I'd like to move to a roll call vote, and the clerk of committees will read the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Yang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. No. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Chairman Phelan. Yes. Six members passed. Seven members. Seven, seven members approved. Seven. The motion has, has been passed. Um, as the chairman, I will be bringing this out at reports of committees for the final vote of the city council. But the committee, the committee vote is, is seven to one. Um, so at this time, seeing no other business before the finance committee, uh, I'm going to recess, recess and we'll be starting the regular council meeting. I would like to call the meeting to order the Monday, November 21st, 2022, Quincy City Council meeting. It is now 731. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Present. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor Harris. Councilor Liang. Present. Council Mahoney. Present. Council McCarthy. Present. Councilor Phelan. Present. President DeBona. Present. Seven members, you have a quorum. Seven members, we have a quorum. Councilor Harris. Councilor Harris is in attendance. Eight. Uh, please stand if you can. If we can get a moment of silence. Um, please use it as you wish. Turn to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, please read the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Madam Clerk, first item on the agenda. First item is compost task force presentation. Um, before we get started, I'm going to leave it over to uh, Mr. Walker here, Chris Walker, for the intro. Um, just want to thank uh, Emily Liebel from the school committee for coming in tonight as well. Um, and with that, Chris Walker, you sure. have the floor. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. President, um, on behalf of the mayor, um, I would like to thank the compost task force. If this body remembers, it was a resolution of this body. Um, urging the administration to form this task force, um, including members from this body, uh, to discuss and uh, develop a feasibility plan and a master plan for potential uh, composting within the city of Quincy. Um, the group did a tremendous amount of work. Um, there has been some positive action uh, coming from their work, um, and they are here this evening uh, to present to you. So with that, I will hand it over to Shelly Dean, our esteemed Energy and Sustainability Manager, and School Committee Member Emily Lebo. I'm not sure who's going first, but they're going to lead the presentation on behalf of the task force. If I could, Mr. Walker, I'd like to put in our 15-minute rule for our counselors as well, just a, just a note, not, not for you, uh, Shelly and uh, Emily, but um, for the counselors, so I'm going to put that in post. Feel free. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to start by just mentioning the, the there was a 10-member um, task force created, and I just want to acknowledge the, the members. Um, Chris Walker, um, Councillor Ann Mahoney, were, were, um, and a school committee member Emily Lebo. Um, many of you may remember former um, recycling and waste manager uh, John Sullivan, um, uh, and uh, 
and, and largely members of QCAN, but, but other environmentalists as well, including Maggie McGee, um, David Reich, Sarah Montague, Mary Lally, um, uh, Michael Hurley, and myself. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to Maggie McGee, who really chaired the, all of our work and really was very instrumental in putting this together. So let me turn it, turn it over to you, and I will jump in later. Did you tell me how to use this, Shelley? <laughs> I think, yes, you did. So I know you folks got this uh, report, and you've read it all. <laughs> it's very, very dense. It's from Maggie McGee, and it's, she's a scientific writer. So when you go through it, you'll see that it's really well done. Maggie really was the driving force behind this. And uh, she's at home watching now, so our best wishes to her. So um, food waste is equal to 21% of the U.S. trash by weight. Quincy residents create an estimated 6,300 tons of food waste per year. The liquid and food waste requires more energy to burn. In November of 2018, Councilor Harris came up with a resolution to have the city look into forming a task force and starting to compost. And that mayor's task force was made up, and as Shelley told you, we met monthly from April 2009 through January 2020, and then you know what happened. Um, but anyway, what some of the stuff that we did, we had fact-finding interviews and field trips. We really, May had us really doing our homework. We visited Black Earth Composting in Manchester by the Sea. We, went, we visited the schools in Cambridge who were having, who were doing composting. We went to the Stop and Shop aerator. And then we also had a long conversation virtually with Professor Sally Brown, a composting expert out of Washington. We had a meeting with the owners of Black Earth Composting to see if that could go through. And then we had a site visit, a second site visit to their facility to find out if there were any noxious odors coming out of the composting or any problems with the smell. We also went to the Deer Island aerobic digester. And in February, uh, some members visited the uh, Core E, the centralized organics recycling plant in Charlestown that turns composting into sludge. Right now, there is mandated food waste diversion in Massachusetts. Food diversion from large waste generators started in 2014 for anybody producing more than one ton of trash a week. And this had, has led to large food donation and rescue efforts. It was amazing for us to see when we visited Stop and Shop how much of their food is being rescued and donated because of this law. Because they don't want to pay for the cost of composting it. It is actually cheaper for them to give it away. So they, they watch their, their food constantly checking the dates and just to see what they do to make sure as much of that food as possible gets out to the community. Food diversion from small businesses and non-residents is planned to start in 2030. That means we all will be required to be composting. And this information was as of June 20, June 20th. June 2020. At least 19 communities in the, have curbside composting. You can see them there. And a number of mass communities with drop-off sites for food waste collection is 40. Food waste is diverted in Massachusetts in multiple ways. As I said, food rescue, which is happening with a lot of the supermarkets. Animal feed, there are some towns that use all of their composting for animal feed. Composting backyard, curbside pickup and drop-off sites and anaerobic digestion. What's available in Quincy is the city sells discounted backyard composters to residents for yard waste and food waste. We also have curbside pickup composting subscriptions by Black Earth Composting, Bootstrap Composting, and City Composting. I've been composting through Black Earth Compost for three years, as has all the members of my family and their households. And no problems whatsoever with smell or rodents or anything else, and it reduces the trash by an inordinate amount of, of, of volume. And the benefits this would bring to the city of Quincy, lower our climate cha charge footprint by reducing greenhouse gases associated with inefficient food waste burning, decrease the cost of the city's trash tipping fees by removing heavy food waste, estimated at about, in this, and this is in 2020, $200,000 a year. 
Separating food waste from other trash results in cleaner trash that has less food sources for, for rodents. And have a plan to address the Department of Environmental Protection's increasingly strict food bans. Thank you. So we also wanted to um, we also wanted to head on uh, address sort of head on any potential problems that are associated with food diversion and food waste, and we know that uh, residents in Quincy are concerned about rodents. Um, and what we what we learned is that it's inc it's very important that the curbside um, containers are securely latched, so that if they tip over in a storm and you know or for whatever reason that they stay closed and that um uh and when done commercially um food food waste uh food waste that is composted generates so much heat that rodents don't accumulate um the the um the burrows the um windrows rather um uh heat up to about 140 degrees so they're really inhospitable for for rodents um there there are obviously contamination issues as there always are with any kind of diversion any kind of recycling so we really understand that education is key we um we call upon the dpw uh, as a as a member as a team member for us to really help us with um, education and repeated education and what we found in terms of talking to commercial composters is that residents who who pay for subscription services in fact are very compliant and there's a very low rate of contamination um, we talked about odors um, you know food waste doesn't smell great <laughs> um, but when food waste is composted and there's a very high level of carbon compared to the nitrogen that's mixed in, odors are really minimized and it really is not, not offensive. Um, in addition to, um, to even improve things better than that, there are, there are uh, methods of in-vessel composting that reduce waste, uh, that reduce odors to, to zero. And we also looked at issues about if we're composting, will there be, um, uh, flies and will there be bees? Will there be seagulls and and um, and and unpleasant smells? And again, in talking to communities that are doing drop-off sites where residents are dropping off food waste, we're finding that if they manage the, those sites carefully, um, often in steel containers that um, really are are. Um, impermeable in terms of rodents and, and other pests, that it really is meant that these issues go away. In terms of our recommendations, what, what we realized is that we, we, we understand where we want to go to and we also want to take small incremental steps, but forward steps to get there. And really where we want to get to is we want to get to a point where the city is offering free, free waste, um, free food waste pickup for all residents. And we want to make sure that we're at some point that food waste separation is mandatory. And we also want to get to a point where it is available for all residential buildings, including multifamily uh, building residents. So we've, we've listed a number of immediate steps, uh, uh, steps, some are immediate, some are in the short term, you know, a year or so, some are in a two to three year period, and some are within the next five years. So immediately what we call for, um, and we're happy that post COVID this is happening again, that there is the continuation of sale for home composting bins. We, we call on the DPW to issue an RFQ to select a preferred food waste collection vendor. Um, having one preferred vendor tends to lower prices for residents. We call on, um, we, we, we want to establish an arrangement with a food waste collection vendor to pick up food waste from a, from a centralized collection uh, drop, drop off-site, sorry, I'm stumbling with my words. And uh, we also uh, are hoping that the DPW 
will encourage um, curbside composting. And what many communities have already done is they've used their recycling dividend funds to purchase curbside bins, to, to purchase countertop bins, or to pur purchase bin liners for, for example, for the first 200 residents who sign up. Um, we want to identify uh, composting champions in Quincy. I think you're going to find many of them here in the audience, but there are many more. And we also want to contact Recycling Works for a free consultation to evaluate a Quincy-based composting site. Um, we looked throughout the city. We, we feel like the DPW yard has a potential. We understand there are potential issues there as well, but we want to have a professional evaluation of the site. In the short term, and so those were the immediate recommendations. In the short term, so within the first year, we're hoping to set up a food waste drop-off site at the DPW as the first of many sites within the city. We want to publicize composting on the city's website uh, um, and in so social media, and com food waste composting will include talking about the sale of home composters for folks that it's appropriate for. It's also we want to talk about drop-off sites and we want to talk about subscription services. We want to begin food waste separation and composting in our public schools. We want to review the Recycling Works siting study and we want to prepare and issue an RFP to use, assuming that the study comes out favorably, to use the DPW yard as a composting site, including the option for, for an in-vessel composter. In the, in the middle term, which we describe as two to three years, we want to set up additional drop-off sites in other locations in the city. We want to continue to educate residents, and again, you'll see education of res residents at each stage of our process. We want to continue and purchase and distribute additional starter kits using the, the uh, recycling dividend fund dollars. Um, we want to continue to, esta to establish food separation and composting at additional public schools. And we want to contract with a selected private composting company for a city-funded food waste collection and composting operation again, likely at the DPW or possibly at the DPW. In terms of the longer term recommendations, we want to get to a point where we can offer free curbside food waste pickup to all residents. And, I, and that may sound pretty bold, but I want to say that Quincy is not alone in doing this. There are several communities that are doing this. Boston is doing this uh, fairly recently. Um, Cambridge is doing it. Uh, and there are, there are uh, uh, many communities that are doing it. And Hamilton, in fact, is doing it, and Hamilton has made food waste separation mandatory, which is our next recommendation. We want to consider instituting further incentives for trash reduction. We want to, again, continue to educate residents because that's something that needs to happen continuously. And, uh, and we want to get to a point of mandating food waste and recycling in multifamily buildings. We want to acknowledge that um, there have been several hurdles for, for the task force since we, first, since we last convened. Um, the pandemic slowed us down. <laughs> Um, it slowed down a lot of, a lot of functions, but it, it slowed us down and it slowed our ability to begin composting in schools. We're pleased to report that we've got a plan in place to start a pilot in the schools this year. Um, but at the stage we're at now is we're looking for a qualified person to oversee the program and we're um, interviewing applicants. We also want to acknowledge that DPW staff have raised some concerns about using the DPW yard for both a drop-off site and as well as for on-site composting. And that's why we want there to be a study, a formal study by Recycling Works to figure out whether those concerns are valid and how to, and how to address them. We also want to acknowledge that there, we've had a lot of successes since the task force last met. And these include uh, meetings with Mayor Koch, the Quincy Public Schools, and DPW, um, now with, with, um, uh, with Tom Henry, um, the, new, the new recycling and waste 
uh, coordinator to offer support for starting a pilot program in two elementary schools. Um, other successes are um, Hamilton became the first Massachusetts community to mandate composting. It bans food waste and trash. They will not pick up your trash unless you're composting. In t and most recently, within this past year, Cambridge has expanded their food waste collection program, which is a voluntary program, and it was available to all residents to, to now include small businesses. In addition, Boston began both a food waste drop-off site program. They're, they have 15 sites throughout Boston where residents can drop off their food waste. And they also began the voluntary food waste collection program, um, which they are expanding. In addition, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection um, Green Team Program, which is a, a program for our public schools, established a subgroup to encourage food waste diversion in their schools. So the last thing I want to do is just give you some visuals. So when we talk about food waste and we talk about food waste uh, diversion, uh, many people start out with um, in home and often on their kitchen countertops, composting buckets. And these are just some examples of what they could look, look like. Um, in addition, um, what most people do, myself included, I take my bucket and I move it outside at some point when the bucket is full and I have a collection bin outside. Um, these are some examples of collection bins. Um, the, the first is a locking bin. The second is a bucket that has a locking lid on it. Um, the, the photo, though, uh, I want to acknowledge is for already composted food in the second one. So, so that shows a finished product. Oops, that's sideways. I don't know what to do about that. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I wanted to um, uh, also highlight um, some information about compost drop-off programs. Um, and this, this comes from the city of Boston, though there are many communities that do um, drop-off sites. So I, I, I showed the city of Boston because sometimes we think this only works in rural communities, and obviously Boston is not a rural community. So they, they have on their farmer's market days, they have a drop-off site. Um, they also have a project that they call Project Oscar. I think Oscar is, um, uh, uh, the, the name Oscar comes from um, Oscar the Grouch <laughs> um, and, and his trash bin. Um, but um, it, they're basically collection sites scattered throughout the city um, where folks can, can drop off their food waste. And in addition, at any community gardens that they have, they also have collection sites. So that's the lion's share of what we wanted to present. We've done a, a lot of work. We're hoping um, uh, that the city council will uh, um, take our recommendations under consideration. We know that the administration is already working with us on a number of these items. And we, we're hoping to get to a point where food waste is separated and where it is um, uh, addressed separately from, from trash. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you for your uh, presentation here, the Compost Task Force. Um, I'm going to open it up to councillors. Councillor Kane, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate the comprehensive uh, report and presentation tonight. I think this is such a worthwhile uh, initiative, and I want to thank my colleague, Councillor Harris, for originally proposing uh, exploring this back in 2018. So it's been a long time coming. I think we had an interesting conversation a little bit ago with Commissioner uh, Grazioso about the problems with waste that we're seeing, sort of the waste streams, not only regular municipal solid waste, but also recycling streams. And, uh, you know, this is such a great local solution to be able to take control of, what is it about, you said 20% uh, of the city's waste can be essentially, I don't know, remitted or uh, from this total amount of 30,000 on average weekly, which is unbelievable. Uh, so this is just such a great local proposal driven by the community. So I thank the members of uh, the commission as well for taking part in this. Um, this is just such a unique project and I will support it uh, any way possible. I don't think there's anything before us tonight to make decisions on, 
But uh, as soon as something is proposed, which I think would probably come in the form of a financial measure from the mayor's office or, or something, um, I'm happy to support this initiative. And I also wanted to know, uh, what are the issues, and if I don't know if Commissioner Grazioso wants to address these now, but what are the issues that DPW are seeing uh, with establishing a site uh, at, the, at the headquarters? Um, I, I, th I think one of them was the marshland and whether or not there would be any contamination. So I, that's why we want to have, this, have the site actually reviewed. It may not be a good site. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that was one of the issues. I think uh, another issue that um, uh, uh, the commissioner raised with us is that is there a concern that the city is growing and whether DPW's, um, you know, sort of giving up, giving up some land at DPW. Um, what, what we have heard from composters is that the, the city already has a section of the, of the yard which is used for the collection of yard waste, and that's a very complementary mm -hmm. uh, uh, activity, that most of the yard waste will be used to mix with the food waste to compost. So the expectation is that it won't take up a lot of land, but we need to work through those issues. Got it. Okay. So then we're looking at options of either you can participate in a subscription model, uh, a la this, uh, the black compost company, uh, or we might have something at DPW. Obviously education is a huge component of this. We spent, you know, the last 30 or so years uh, educating people on recycling only to sort of change the rules along the way and go to single stream and, and now it's a whole disaster anyway. Um, and then do you have any estimates on what it might cost for the free curbside? And I use free in quotations because it will cost somebody something. So, so um, with curbside, what many communities do is many communities start with asking residents to pay for their, their own curbside pickup. And... Um, and, uh, you know, the, the cost varies depending on who the composter is and also the frequency of pickup. But often it's maybe $10 or so a week. It, it can vary, but, it, but that's, not an, that's not a crazy number. I, I think I pay $139 every six months. Wow, okay. So, um, and that's in a weekly pickup. Yeah. I'm going to have the option of a buy and every other week put pickups eventually and up will lower the price. But the more people who sign up, yeah, Wait then there's, the yeah, cost it, yeah. With the same subscriber. Got it. And, and the idea of, of moving to a point where the city picks up this cost, as they're doing in Hamilton, for example, um, or ha as they're doing in Cambridge and as they're doing in Boston, is that the residents who choose to pay themselves are really um, transferring some of that cost from the DPW um, to themselves. You know, mm -hmm. the DPW experiences lower tipping costs because residents are now paying for a portion, the heaviest portion of their trash to be picked up by a, a professional composting company. Yep. Once we start having numbers that start making a difference, the, the thought is it really will be revenue neutral or maybe cost, uh, cost neutral, sorry, expense neutral. Um, so the DPW will experience lower costs in terms of having to pay um, trash haulers right now to, to, to move our trash and instead we'll be picking up um, food waste separately. Great. Well, thank you again. Uh, wonderful presentation, wonderful report, such a great community driven project. Happy to support you however you need. Thank you. Councilman Dronico. Thank you, Mr. President. Shelly, Emily, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for this wonderful presentation. And I also want to say thank you to the, your fellow residents that came out to support you uh, during the presentation. I do feel a little bit like I'm back on the school committee talking about composting in schools and Emily giving a presentation on it. So I know the, the pandemic had other plans, but glad to see you're still keeping at it and uh, looking to implement that in the schools. Um, I was curious on the slide under uh, Composting available in Quincy, and then following benefits to Quincy, uh, it, it mentioned you know roughly two hundred thousand dollars in savings uh, you know by removing heavy food waste. And I was just curious if that is right now with existing programs available in Quincy. Is that a projected, or where where does that figure two hundred thousand dollars come in from? 2020. So in twenty twenty. In twenty twenty. Twenty twenty was projected. I would think it would be different now. Gotcha. Do we have an estimate on I guess how many? tons or an amount that's been removed um, like that that two hundred thousand dollars comes from 
That, those, or waste those, reduced, rather. Those were numbers that we got from the from the DPW when we were talking about what does it cost to haul got the it. amount of, of food waste that the city um, that, that's that's mixed into the, the waste in the city stream now. Understood. And, so I mean, with Mr. Andronico, our pilot yeah. program, we're actually going to be. <laughs> We don't usually call them that. <laughs> <laughs> Our pilot program, we're actually going to be weighing the trash at the school prior to doing the program and then after we do the program to get those kind of numbers a little clearer. All about the data, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's good to see. Obviously, I'm in support. Uh, but with 6,300 tons of food waste in Quincy every year, I think there's more money left on the table to uh, um, you know, go back towards DPW. So anyway, thank you so much. I'd like to recognize Council Liang. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I echo my colleague's sentiment, um, and I just want to say too that I'm actually really excited about this because it's this is the best kind of initiative like that's brought in front of us. I think, right, when you've got you know the city councilors, school committee members, the mayor's office, department heads, and you know leaders in the community, advocacy group residents. Like when we all come together and work on one issue, I mean that's that's the best kind of initiative, right? And so that's that's what gets me really excited about this. Um, and I just want to thank you all for for your role in all of it. Um, I, I agree. Again, anything that we can do up here as a body to support this work and have it move forward, you know, I, I'm 100% open to and just in being practical, right, and it's important to take next steps. I really do appreciate how thorough this presentation is and then how you led it up to basically saying, okay, now here are some steps and then here's how long they would take and, you know, realistically, right, what can be done? Because I think that's important is not to bite off more than we can chew, but, you know, work with what we've got and, and keep making progress from there. Um, one foot in front of the other, right? So um, I guess the question I have is, in looking at the different types of recommendations, whether short-term or long-term, um, a lot of it because we can't request funding here, right? We can only approve or cut funding. I, I try to think about, well, what can we do in the meantime? And so, you know, we can legislate up here. Um, and when I read through some of the initiatives, you know, I do see it as possibilities for us to think about on the council, what can we enact up here that could work um, on the other side of it with implementing some of these um, some of these suggestions and with regardless of, of what initiative might you know be something that we could legislate up here the first thing that comes to mind for me is enforcement um, what? enforcement for any of these things right whether we say it's um, something that we want to offer for residences or multifamily residences or small businesses or the schools right I mean like I want to take these steps but every step along the way, again, my mind is going to keep going to enforcement. And so in your very thorough uh, research and conversations and meetings that you had with folks who've been doing this kind of work, did any of them mention any issues that they came across with enforcement or suggestions, best practices, things that will just, you know, get the ball rolling on my end to think about some things that we should be mindful of going into this? I think there was one town that didn't force it and backed off. I can't remember what town that was. Uh, um, I think there was. So... Um, I'm trying to remember the details, um, and and I'm and it's I'm in blanking. The, it on, is in the report. I'm, I'm blanking on on some of those details um, right now. But um, I guess what I would say is, in terms of the um, voluntary subscription services, there is no enforcement really re required in terms of that, because that's voluntary, and and uh, individuals who are motivated are going to participate. Um, in terms of um, getting to a mandatory getting to a point where, where food waste diversion is mandatory. What, what several communities are choosing to do are they're tying their waste pickup to food waste pickup, the same, the same way that some communities are doing that with recycling. They won't pick up your trash if there isn't a recycling bin out there. I think that's not a policy that Quincy has chosen to follow, but it certainly is an option. In Hamilton, what they, um, that it, uh, which is the first community in Massachusetts that's doing mandatory food waste pickup, they won't pick up your, your trash barrel if you don't have a composting bin out there or if you've made an arrangement, if you're doing backyard composting and that's been approved, you know, that's been acknowledged and approved by the, t by the town, um, then they'll pick up your, mm -hmm. your waste. But, but it, otherwise, if you just don't put out a, a barrel, they won't pick it up. Interesting. Okay. Trash, rather. I appreciate that. It's, um, I think here in Quincy, you know, we have an interesting layout with where residences are, right? With um, some areas, I think, of the city having really wide sidewalks, ample parking, some with, you know, wide sidewalks, but no parking. And, you know, like, it's just, 
some with no sidewalks at all, right? That some people's houses, they don't, you know what I mean? Like they have that sort of curb that there's no even curb cut. It just goes right into uh, the road itself. And a lot of people park their cars up there. So there's a lot of things, again, that I'm thinking about. I just want to make sure, when I say enforcement, I don't mean it to say in a punitive way to have folks compost, right? And, and saying that you need to do this. And so it's punitive. I'm more so thinking to respond to any issues that do come up. How do we make sure that we are um, providing enforcement um, methods that work well in order to ensure that, you know, this is a, a successful, um, I think, route that we take. And so it's just things to think about. And I know, again, just based off the information that's in front of us, how thoroughly all of you have looked into this. And so I look forward to catching up with all of you um, as we move forward in our role and what we can do up here to be supportive of this. So thank you. And we would definitely have to speak to uh, Tom Henry and Mr. Grazioso about that, because if you weren't picking up my neighbor's trash, I wouldn't be happy. Right, no, I, I agree. <laughs> it's kind of enhanced, but it's kind of, a, you know, that, that stick doesn't work. It wouldn't work in So I think we have to be, much more importantly, I think, is that we have to get some success behind the initiative. Right, right. If we have to get some success behind the initiative and get some excitement about it. Mm -hmm. Because when you do this, it gets pretty exciting. Yeah. Because you can actually see in your trash the difference. So I think that's the most important thing. In 2030, you're going to have to do it anyway. By then, we'll have, these guys will have to figure out how to enforce yeah. I don't um, know how they're doing mat mattresses, but we'll see. Mattresses right now. And, and I, I am actually remembering the... the, the I uh, remember the two. It wasn't quite uh, what I okay. said. Okay. Um, uh, at, at one point, um, I think it was actually Wenham. I'm not sure it was Hamilton. But, but um, what they decided to do was they had such a reduction in, tr in trash, in, in trash without food waste in it, um, that they had moved to picking up trash every other week. And they had, and they were doing a food waste pickup every week, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and there were some people who objected to that. So, so they they, yeah. they rolled that back and decided to do both weekly. Well, yeah, it, hey, if we don't try, we're not going to know what works and doesn't work, right? So again, kudos to all of you for your hard work. I really appreciate it. Sure. I, really, it was a, it was a team. It was a team, and we have. I know there are members of the Wallace and Garden Club. You know, we're everywhere who are going to be volunteering in the schools. To see if they can help get the program started. We have somebody with us tonight, Ruth Davis, who's a new member. But, but Ruth uh, was the person who was in charge of all of this at MIT and just retired and is giving us her expertise. So Great. we're pleased. Yeah, it sounds like we're in really good hands. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Reza. Uh, I'd like to recognize Council Mahoney. First, I'd like to, um, I'd like to thank um, Councillor Harris for bringing the resolve in. And then also, I think you called me Councillor Harris, and that's how I became part of the composting task force. And it was, um, it was a huge learning curve, let me tell you. It was in, it, trash is funny here in Quincy, right? As soon as you start talking about trash or changing the way we're going to pick it up or even recycling, that was a challenge because we couldn't get people to, to really do it. Or was it the, the companies you were hiring because it's supposed to be going into one truck, not in the other? We, we have a lot of challenges when it comes to this. But what I had noticed... Um, was that you see the you see the composting companies like yourself, Emily? You're one of the people who are doing that. You see them in Quincy, so you know they're being picked up. It's it's you know there are. I was just wondering if we know how many people in Quincy are doing that. I think I think it's less than a thousand people. Less than a thousand people. Less than a thousand houses. I think there's several hundred at at Black Earth. I know there are. I'm not sure about Bootstrap and City Composting. I think has a smaller. Mm -hmm. A smaller number, so. Yeah, the reason why I ask that is because this is something that, it's an edu obviously it was educational to me to be on the com com composting task force, but it's also just educational for people at home because they hear this, it's just something else that's changing in their life. And most people are so busy that they're just like, what, what, what day is my trash coming? What, you know, oh, it's a holiday week. <laughs> is it, yeah. you know, I put my trash out, it's not coming the next day. It would be nice if they picked it up on trash day, but that's not the case. Yeah, so, so the, so. I to make that demand yet. Yeah. <laughs> so the interesting thing is that, that it's come a long way. So since, since this all started, we've come a long way. And I'm excited to see some of these things where it's like, like maybe having, you know, get some of the savings that we're having and, and purchase 200 and get 200 more people to make it 1,200 people in the city of Quincy. Do we know how many people who also have composting in their backyard? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know, Tom? I don't know the exact number. Okay. Probably average 50 bins a year that and the reason why I ask that, because that's another piece of the puzzle, if you know people are doing it at home. But really, it's about educating the population of the city of Quincy about those things. And I know, like, in Somerville, they did some fun, like, videos on, on composting and that they would go around to different events and festivities that were happening in their community. And I know that, that that's something that, you know, we're going to be trying to educate people on, because the more people that know it and realize that it's not a foreign thing, it's actually pretty easy and can be pretty exciting. And it can be educational if you have young kids at home. Um, 
And um, it's just, to me, I'm just excited that it's here. And I am gonna echo some of the, my fellow colleagues. This is a great presentation. Um, sometimes we lack our presentations up here um, on the council, and this one has, it's very dense, but it's, it's got a lot of information in it. And I think it's really, it's, it's great to have. And I look forward to having those conversations as we go forward, because it's only gonna get, cost us more money as we go forward too, because recycling is no longer something that's gonna be a savings to the taxpayers of the Quincy. And, and we're already seeing mattresses have to go into a different way of, of um, being picked up. And those things are gonna continue to change. Like clothing can no longer, it's gonna be eventually clothing cannot, cannot be um, thrown out as, as well. So there are ways that they're trying to, to train the homeowners, the people that live that throw trash to be able to, to do the right thing with, the, with their trash. So this is just another piece of the education that we have to do. And, and I think once people get used to it, it will be, or maybe volunteer for it, they might realize it's, it's not as hard as one would think. Um, one of the questions is if it goes to the DPW and, it's, um, and we're using the natural resources of the yard waste that's being picked up, would they be composting it there at the DPW? Is that the plan? I'm sorry. Compo I composting at the DPW is at the plan that they would be composting it there at the DPW. Um, so, so that's something that we'd like to to have investigated. Mm -hmm. um, the um, composting companies that we've spoken to um, are are willing to pick up our tr the food waste mm -hmm. and haul it somewhere else. Right. Um, but quite frankly, those sites are getting full, mm -hmm. and the longer that they haul it. Um, you know, that takes a certain amount of fuel to, to haul pretty heavy so It's counterproductive food in some ways. Yeah, if we can do it here, it would be. Intuitive. So you, you'd like to be able to uh, compost it more locally. Mm -hmm. And our thought was to, to examine whether the DPW yard could be used. And there, is there a second benefit to that, too? If we're composting here in Quincy, would we be able to use the rich soil that's created from it? Oh, absolutely. Because we absolutely. do an awful lot of stuff here in the city of Quincy, too. So it's, it's, it's just, we're, you know, I'm glad that we're doing this now and we're having these conversations so that we, as we grow and this initiative becomes more um, easy to accept in the community, I think because it's, it's an educational piece that has to happen, that we'll be prepared to do that. I'm, I'm looking forward to those conversations and, and hopefully working with the DPW and the administration to make that happen. I just want to thank, to you know, QCAN, um, I think you can brought this to several of the counselors and again, Councilor Harris brought it before here and, and all of you for taking the time and educating all of us, including myself on the task force about this because as we grow as a city, we need to continue to have those conversations to find ways that we can actually work together as a community and to, to offset those costs because it probably will never make us money, but to be cost neutral in our trash pickup and then doing something good for the environment is, is what we should expect from all of us because we'll all be working together in that, that essence. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Councilor Fallon. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, through, through you, Ms. President, uh, to, to Ms. Dean, um, is it, it's 2030, this becomes mandatory? that we have to separate anyways? Um, th that's, the, that's the expectation that DPW, um, not DPW, I'm sorry, DEP has, has stated. So they're gonna be, this is something that's gonna be mandated anyways. Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember the exact year that um, DEP uh, mandated that um, large generators of food waste um, mm -hmm. uh, that generated um, a ton of food waste a year had to um, could no longer dispose of their food waste in their trash that had to be separated and picked up. Just this past month, um, actually on November 1st, they reduced that number to half. Um, if they reduce it to half again, many of our schools will be subject to that. Um, so, it, you know, they, they are projecting that. that in Incrementally, they're and winding it back. And, and, uh, I mean, it's good, for the, it's good for the environment. It's good for saving tipping costs. There's, there's a lot of benefits to it. Um, I would re, you know, education is going to be the key to this Absolutely. because I was on the committee with Larry Cretion when we brought recycling to Quincy back in the, in the late eighties. So as a council member, I was on that committee and it was a lot of work. So I really appreciate what you folks are doing, <laughs> coming in, doing all this work. There's a lot of work that had to be set up. Uh, we had a couple of missteps along the way. Uh, we were doing it biweekly, and then that wasn't working. Um, they had to do s separate things; had to be sorted separately. There was a lot of there was a lot of education to get out to the neighborhoods. We even had a point where we had uh, 
we had captains on streets that would check bins and suggest to the neighbor, well, maybe you could do this, maybe you could do that. But it is, it, it, I'm glad to see that you're taking it in this gradual, gradual way. And I think it's um, something that's really worth looking at in a, in a study to figure out where we can put the, to start by putting drop-offs, because that was originally what we did. But you're also gonna run into the things where you got multifamily homes in Quincy where we do the condo pickup. I know I see Tom Henry out there. We've had several uh, <coughs> different stops and starts on the condo pickup on a couple of places. And he's, they've always responded really good and took care of it. But there's also gonna be the education level because it's not, unlike a Hamilton, it's not just single family <coughs> homes. There's a lot of multi residents, apartment buildings, condo buildings, and we treat the trash pickup <coughs> with the condo buildings just like it was, because they own the, they own the unit. They're, they're, they're a homeowner, basically. So um, I think education is key. I like the approach you're taking. I think it has, to be, it has to be slow, incremental, and move forward. But I think in the end, it's the right thing to do is to move in this direction. And uh, I think it, it's continuing to educate, to get, to get the information out there to people. Starting with the schools is always a great, great spot because those kids later on, I find, because now I have adult children who are some of the best recyclers because they, they learned it in school and it became part of them when they, when they got older. So I think um, you know, that's a great place to go and I, I fully support it. But I think I can even remember when the garbage man used to come down the street in Quincy. I'm old enough, uh, I'm on Medicare now, so I'm old enough to remember when the garbage man came down the street and, would, and you would put your garbage out and went to a farm to, for animal feed. So it was only, uh, I think I was in high school when they changed that in Quincy. But uh, that was something we did do in, in the city. But I think um, it's a good plan, but I think we also have to take into consideration the condos, the apartment buildings, and all those. That has to be part of it in the end. But um, I support making the move and doing the study and bringing this all in. Um, but uh, it, it will take a lot of... Well, you might have a few stops and starts. I remember some frustrating starts when we first did the recycling. I think, I think um, one of the <coughs> ideas behind the drop-off sites is that um, um, what, what we've heard from other communities is that residents who use drop-off sites, sometimes it, it's, it's a financial decision. They don't want to pay for the, for the subscription service themselves. Um, they may live in a single-family or two-family home where the, the, the city or town would pick up their their waste, um, but um, but it also provides an opportunity for residents in multifamily properties, including condominiums, to drop off their food waste if they're so so motivated. I think that would be. To mention, Mr. Phelan, that we have both of our high schools have green teams, and actually QCAN has a youth task force also. So we'll have lots of students who will be excited to get involved with this too and help us mm -hmm. as we roll it out. They've already expressed interest in helping us, so. Yeah. Well, thank you, great report. I look forward to the more, the, more, the more information, the more stuff coming in. Thank you for all your hard work. I'd like to recognize Councilor Harris. Thank you, President Tabona, and ladies, thank you for presenting great presentation. The team, thank you. Um, and my colleagues and the administration who are, who are uh, in support of this. And when I hear 2018, I say to myself, where did, where did 2018 go? But, <laughs> but and um, uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to, just to mention though, but, and it's kind of a question, but not, um, won't the food waste costs be uh, offs will offset the tonnage deduction of uh, everyday trash costs, correct? So there is, folks, there is, there is a, uh, there's a positive there. And um, I think that it's something that, um, uh, as, as, as Councilor uh, is leaving, uh, <laughs> we were having a discussion on it, but I think it's important. I'm glad, and it's, it, it's really serious, uh, serious because our environment, we see the changes, and we just gotta try to catch up with the changes before, before my great grandchildren and everybody else's, uh, you know, 
uh, don't benefit, so they can benefit what we were able to in life. So thanks. Thank you for your support. And thank you for all your hard work, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Counselor. Um, everybody. Um, I, I like this idea of the pilot program, basically in the elementary schools, like <coughs> Counselor Phelan said, educating our children to kind of do this and, and, and um, basically just get a pilot program, get some information, get some data supporting it. Um, I like the suggestion of the DPW drop-off. It's voluntary. So if you want to be opt into this program, you can go down to the DPW and drop it off, you know, I don't know, Monday, Wednesday, Fridays at certain times and have a, obviously a landfill, collect some data, see if people are really involved with it. Um, but in Hamilton, this is a question for you, how, how do they mandate this? Um, you know, I, I look at something like this and I think of ballot, this is a ballot initiative question. Um, have other towns and cities done a ballot initiative where they put it on the ballot to ask the, the citizens of the, the voters of the, of, of the town or city to vote on this type of initiative? Has that happened? Not that I know, but it's, if it's mandated, it's not really much. Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware that any other communities have um, uh, have voted on it. I, I don't know. I don't know. Have you done any questionnaires or anything? Like, for instance, I look back at what, what was accomplished on the Penns Hill Association, where they wanted the gate and walls uh, over on the Independence Ave gate open at the MBTA. And they, we, we deliberated on that for almost two years mm -hmm. uh, with the opening of that gate, but they collected data. They collected questionnaires <coughs> with all the residents in the area. You could do a volunteer online and you give, you know, you don't have to give your address. You could give your name of the street. And then they did door to door um, and they collected data to support that being opened. We, we looked at all different avenues. We, we had a lot of different information in here. Um, making that ordinance change and opening that gate up, which, which is very successful to this day. But we had stuff in place um, for people who were violating and parking in that area that didn't live there. Uh, in this particular situation, you said earlier, like somebody objected to kind of the mandatory situation is, is maybe if, if, if you go, and I'm, this is only a suggestion, if we get a questionnaire and, and collect some data on it, and see how many people are really interested in this. So I, I, I what I would say is that um, early on, um, Maggie put out on social media some, just some question, maybe not formal questionnaires, but some, some questions about you know who would be interested, and um, some of that information resides in the report. I think I think there were something like 50 residents who who said, oh, absolutely, and that was not very well publicized. It was sure. several years ago. You know, I think environmental awareness has grown since then. I'm not even sure that many of the people here even signed, signed up then. Sure. You know, I, I think that there are a lot of people who, who are, in fact, very interested. Sure. Um, certainly when we're at a voluntary stage, I think the thought was we wouldn't have to go through a formal survey, but as we get closer to mandating things, that's a very good idea. And after we do some education. Sure, because I mean, I, I know GC even with the recycling situation, just I don't know if all residents put out a recycling and a trash. Mm -hmm. um, and I like your idea if you're not going to pick up, the, if you don't have your recycling out there, we're not going to pick up your trash. So it's the same situation. You know, but at the same token, there are people that object to it, you know. And I love the activists that are here, you mm -hmm. know, to, to really push, um, you know, this is going to, it's good for the environment. And, and I, I sat down with um, Dave Reg from the, um, Q, Q can some years ago when we first got I first got into the council. Um, Joe Finn was still on. It was me, Joe, and, and Nina. We, we, I eventually sat down with them in his residence, um, and we talked about this. And I said, "It's good. It's good. Good. Let's just support some data that that supports this." So um, I'm glad that the councilors all um, talked about this. If it's going to save money for the folks and it's good for the environment, it's good. And that's why we're having the discussion up here. But there are some folks out there that may object to it, and you, you have to. You Absolutely. have to kind of say, okay, let's let's have a questionnaire. Let's get some data. Let's see support this. Um, so that would just be a, a recommendation, you know, moving forward. And if, as as Council Phelan said, if this is going to be mandated in you know 2030, um, and then you know this we're eight years away. At least we can collect some data and get it. Mm -hmm. So something to consider for the Very future down idea. the road, and you know, and get some concrete evidence. I know in some areas of the city, even with our trash collecting. It can be difficult. I mean, Walston Hill, <laughs> perfect example. Some of those hills, like Highland Ave, is just a, it's it's one of the steepest hills I've ever 
by not walking and, and even in a vehicle. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's just um, the impact of, of co collecting and then um, obviously having a trash, a, a collection of recycling, and then a compass, compost. So you have three different pickups. Um, it, it, this is a question for Mr. Walker. We, we, we currently have a contract with Capital Waste, is that correct? Would this alter the contract for any type of composting um, involvement for the pickup? Yeah. And <clears throat> Through you, Mr. President, um, that would be part of a contractual process if we went to the full scale where picking up compost like we pick up trash and recycling. Um, the question would be whether our capital would be able to do something like that or we would uh, either do it in-house ourselves or uh, would there be a third party, one of these companies, would they have the ability uh, to scale up to the necessary level that would um, be required to do the whole city. Um, that's something that, you know, as we go through the process, that's obviously something we'd be looking at. Thank you, Mr. Walker. I mean, I love the fact that Emily Liebel, you had you paying 139 for six months, and I don't think folks even know that you can you can actually do that in the city. Voluntarily have a have someone come out and pick up the compost. What is it? Once a week. Once a week. Once a week for the environment and. As, you, as, this, as this carries on, you get more people interested in, in, in education is gonna be huge with the outreach of this. So I think if we give an option to possibly go to DPW to give people the volunteer, almost like a transfer station in these other towns where they come in and they drop off their trash every week. Well, we're very lucky here in Quincy that we get it picked up, that we'll see how many people do really actually come in with the compost and we can really get some hardcore data. But that would be great, I, I wish, I hope, uh, do, do we have the capability, there's a question for uh, Mr. Gracias, Commissioner. Do we have the capabilities of putting it up at the DPW if we um, were to do it now? Right now, no. Okay. Uh, because of different factors, we have uh, all times in home safety headquarters, moving all those people to that location. Um, there's a number of issues we have to study. Uh, currently, to be, that could be a, that's, that's a major issue. Actually. Major issue, okay. Uh, but no, we just have to study it and take a good out look at it. How, how did Boston succeed with their voluntary free food waste collection program? How did they put this into existence here in this last year? How did they do it? It's a you know? brand new program, so I'm not really sure, but they have three different vendors who okay. will pick up in the city. So they're using three different vendors, and they're paying for the bins and the bags for anybody who's willing to compost. So I don't think they even know if they have data yet. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to okay. that. Um, I, can, I can ask, but I don't this know is the great. answer. I don't know the history. I really appreciate you coming in tonight and getting these. These are a lot of questions that we, we would like to succeed with if we put, put this forward. And we, we also like to see the data that, that in these questionnaires would be really huge. Um, and I think it's a great thing. I, I have a two family and the, the folks that, that, that rent out, they, they do the compost and so they have somebody pick it up. So they really enjoy doing that. So thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. Next item on the agenda, Madam Clerk. Number two, 2022-139, a resolve communications equipment, three Dorchester Wait. Street. I'm gonna recognize Wait. Councilor Harris. Wait. Councilor. Yeah, wave the rating and... Uh, um, so, good evening, counselors. Um, is Jen, Jen here? Yep, thanks, there you are, thanks. Um, good evening, counselors. Uh, the resolution um, in front of you, um, first of all, I'm gonna start off by saying I'm not an expert on some of the things that is, is being presented and talked about. Um, we, thank you, we depend upon, um, we depend upon experts to assist us uh, whenever we have um, whenever we have uh, topics that we're bringing up which involve the city um, and department heads um, for instance in this case obviously uh, we have Jay Duca who's been a, who's always a great source uh, for, for us um, we depend upon the zoning board uh, the ZBA to 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 do the right thing by us uh, and the citizens. Obviously, we follow like the uh, city solicitor. We follow 
we, we follow the leads or we take the advice and we, we make our decisions on what we're going to present. As you can see um, uh, up above, you can see uh, this, is, this is something that took, uh, that came, that took place in, um, well, it's taken place over the last few years, but um, I'll start off by saying um, a new singular wireless uh, PCS uh, LLC, uh, an LLC was granted a special permit by the Zoning Board of Appeals in October of 2020 as required by the Federal uh, Communications Commission to install and operate a wireless communication facility atop of 3 Dorchester Street, uh, which everybody knows, uh, 3 Dor Dorchester Street overlooks the water, this overlooks um, the, bay, uh, the bay that overlooks um, Marina Bay. Um, the, um, the proponent as part of the permit committed to several measures to ensure that the equipment did not create visual blight on the neighborhood. Those conditions specifically state the equipment would be installed in a manner that minimizes visual impacts upon the surrounding area and does not adversely impact the character of the neighborhood or, or social structures. The antennas and equipment will be, would be wrapped in a film to minimize visual impact on the area. So if you can see the pictures above, uh, how's that working out? It's not. Every picture tells a story, and this is 100% unacceptable. The LLC has refused to meet this condition two years after the special permit. Counselors, the LLC has ignored repeated requests from the Department of Inspectional Services to install the visual mitigation measures as described in the permit and has most recently failed to communicate at all with the city officials. This blatant violation of the permit continues to cause a visual blight for many parts of the Squanum neighborhood. And first and foremost, the immediate abutters to that said property. So I'm asking the, the Quincy City Council uh, request the Department of Special Services to revoke the special permit granted by the Zoning Board for non-compliance and that updates be provided directly to the Public Works Committee of this council. Um, Councilors, I gave you hard copies of the, of the pictures. Uh, there's also um, the record and decision of the, of the case, the, the 20, uh, ZBA 2047. If, if you'd look at, at, at the second page, um, at the second page under uh, evidence and testimony presented, uh, number three, if you go down to about the fourth line from the bottom, AT&T's panel antennas will be camouflaged with a reflective tape so to appear as brick on the rooftop. AT&T's equipment will be centrally located on the roof of the building. Well, let, let me ask you a question. Does that look like it's in the center of the building? Or does it look like, where's, where's the brick that's supposed to camouflage it? This is two years later. Um, if we uh, go to the, to make a point of the ZBA um, decision, uh, which is um, in, in halfway down, the decision is, is clear. Um, a special permit shall be granted by the, um, the, a special permit shall be granted by the special permit granting authority unless otherwise specified. Only upon its written determination that the proposed use of the structure shall not 
cause substantial detriment to the neighborhood or the city, taking into, the, into account the char characteristics of the site and of the proposal in relation uh, to that site. In addition to any specific factors that may be set forth in the ordinance. So basically folks, we have the opportunity, if you could help my ward, my community, fix something that got broken in during what was the beginning, basically the beginning stages of COVID. We've talked about how COVID um, has caused things to take place. One way or another, the FCC was ruling in favor uh, of allowing a site like this to take place if, in fact, um, the conditions were right. But obviously, there's the, uh, and I, I honestly believe if, uh, if that members of the FCC leadership would have come here, come to our, that neighborhood and look, they would agree with me and my constituents it's just not what they, they described should be there. So um, I'm just asking that we revoke the permit. We ask that, that, that the city revokes the permit. Let them start from scratch. They're ignoring us. They're not responding to us. And if anybody says that they're finished, well, it, that, that we haven't signed off on the permit yet. So we haven't even inspected it. There, there, are, there are so many different rules about flat, um, flat rooftops and uh, when structures are put uh, on, on flat roofs, there's a, a six foot rule. Now, if, you, if anybody tells me that, that those uh, mechanisms, that's six feet in from the edge, it's not. There's supposed to be fencing around it to protect my, uh, the citizens that we represent. It, it could be somebody from Ward, from anywhere from Ward 1 all the way to Ward 6 that's in that neighborhood. We don't know, the city doesn't know. We haven't been up there and been able to, to inspect it. What could happen? We don't know how well that was put on. We don't. So I asked, I asked, my, my colleagues, and I've asked you before, this is an, another example of the, my community being um, affected by an outside bigger agency saying that we have to do something that isn't right for the community. So I asked, I asked uh, my colleagues again, uh, most sincerely to, to uh, uh, support this, and I asked that the city um, city, uh, if passed, will will revoke the permit. And I, I make a motion to approve. Motion made by Councilor Harris. Do you want to put this in public works as well, or just to, to just vote on it? Uh, I, I'd like to vote on it because then, yep. um, but that, because then yep. uh, they're going to have to come in front. They're going to have to come in front of the Public Works Committee. Okay. And I don't know who's in charge. Who's the so, chairman of the call? That's, so I, that's you want to move for approval yeah, and you want to put it in a Public Works? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And seconded made by Council Yang. Any discussion on the motion? I just want to uh, privilege, I, I want to thank Councilor Harris for putting this forward. I want to thank you for your pictures. Very important to let the public know. Um, I've fielded a couple emails and I'm in su <laughs> full support of Councilor Harris' resolution to revoke this. So. I want to thank you for, for putting this forward um, and, and, and actually supporting the, and backing it up with the, with the aerials uh, of photos. And uh, it almost looks like a UFO is up there. So who knows what's going to be happening up there. Um, so with that, uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Eight members. Eight members in the affirmative. Motion carries and it's also going to go into public works. Thank you, Councilor Harris. Um, Madam Clerk, is that all the agenda items for tonight? It is. It is. So we're on to approval of previous minutes. Now we have one back from October 17th. 
and November 14th. Motion made by Councilor um, Kane to approve, seconded by Councilor Yang. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Um, communication reports from the mayor, other city officers, and city boards. Anyone, counselors? Unfinished business and proceeding mini meeting. Counselors? Reports of committees. Chairman Phelan from the finance, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, through you. Um, the, the finance committee held a committee meeting tonight and voted out a, a positive recommendation on 2022-126, $23 million for the public safety headquarters construction and transportation improvements. Um, I'd like to make a motion to, to approve, to approve um, 126. Positive recommendation. A motion made by Councillor Phelan to Approve the 23 million for the public safety headquarters. Do I have a second? Seconded by Councilor Harris. Any discussion on the motion? None. Seeing none, up. Oh. Councilor Mahoney, you have the floor. So I just wanted to take a moment because I am the only one who voted no. And, um, and the reason why I have, I voted yes for the $120 million. So I do want you know, people to understand that this is something that does have to happen. The police station has to happen. My reasons for voting no on the $23 million is because I believe the administration didn't think about ways that they could have cut costs on the building as they have in previous projects all the way back in the beginning in the humble times when they first started when we were going through a recession at that time. We're in a similar situation. It's different. It's COVID, but it's a similar situation where escalation costs, things are happening. People will say it's not in our control or they can blame it on the federal government. But the reality of it is that we had $46 million of COVID money that could be spent to offset in other areas of our city to save our taxpayers the, the pain that they're receiving when they actually are dealing with the increase of food costs or the increase of their heat and their electricity or the increases of the taxes that we have. So I just wanted to explain my rationale behind my vote just one more time for people to understand that it is not that I don't support or think that this is something that we need to do. I just think that we're, there were ways that we could have shown um, the people at home, the taxpayers of the city of Quincy, that we were working collaboratively to make this the most affordable and the best building that it could be for the, for the police headquarters. Thank you. It's a motion made by Councilor Phelan and seconded by Councilor Harris. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. No. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. President DeBona. Yes. Seven members. Seven members in the affirmative, one with a no, and a motion carries for the 23 million um, public safety headquarters. Um, any more um, reports of committees? Moving on, presentation of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. Um, I recognize Council Yang. Thank you. I, I was just trying to talk to my colleague over there, uh, Councilor Fain. So um, as most of you, if not everyone, has heard already, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, there was um, a horrific incident that happened. Um, to a woman at the Wallace and T station, and there had been a lot of, uh, I think, concerns expressed, not just in that general area, but across the city. And very unfortunately, so this isn't the, the only incident, I think, that has, you know, caused us all to be reflective of, um, you know, just public safety best practices and what we can do, you know, to all remain diligent, um, supportive of one another, but ultimately safe um, ourselves here. So, um, Councillor Phelan, Councillor Kane, um, with support of the mayor's office and, of course, the chief of police are going to be hosting a community meeting next Monday um, over at 80 Clay Street. The Quincy Housing Authority will be hosting us at 530 just to get an update on what's going on. But more importantly, again, talk about um, how KPD is here to support us if and when we ever need to report an incident. Um, but also, you know, just, again, public safety best practices as well that we can all, um, you know, learn from them and take away. So I just wanted to let folks know in case you haven't already heard, to uh, please come along or encourage other folks to come as well. Again, even though it happened in the Wallace area, I know that folks across the city are looking for um, some, again, tools and tips on protecting ourselves moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Yang. Anyone else? 
Um, Councilor Phelan, you have the floor. Um, I don't, I'd also like to um, just thank a lot of my colleagues, sad day. We were at the uh, Interface Social and they were giving out the turkey baskets for everyone and several of my colleagues here on the council showed up and rolled up their sleeves and helped give out the baskets and everything. So um, a tip of the cap to the, uh, there a lot of United Way volunteers, a lot of members from the unions were there and uh, just a lot of volunteers and I did check with Mark Flaherty and they gave out over 1,600 tur turkey meals for, uh, for Thanksgiving. So I thank everyone who showed up. Um, I think it's a great thing that, uh, that Interface Social does there and provides a tremendous service. So um, kudos to them and kudos to all my colleagues who not only talked about it, but rolled up their sleeves and got involved. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Phelan. It's good to see a couple of our colleagues on there um, in the assembly line giving out those turkeys. Thank you. Um, Councilor Harris, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, I, again, I want to thank my, the support uh, that uh, my, the councilors uh, had give Ward 6. Um, again, I've came and I asked for something and, I, and nobody disappointed. And with that, I just want to wish uh, my colleagues a, a, a real uh, happy Thanksgiving and everybody, everybody else. I'm looking forward to this, this Thanksgiving. First time as a grandfather, so I'm, I'm really excited about this. Well, it's, yeah, well, it was, yeah. He's getting big fast, so it's great. So, yeah, he's getting big fast, so thank you. Get your sleep. Um, but anyway, Monday, November, December, 16th, uh, December 19th is the last meeting of the City Council, which will convene at 6.30. So those are two last meetings of the year. Um, and with that, motion, to motion made by Councilor Yang to adjourn. Seconded by Councilor Andronico. We are now... Dismissed.